Welcome, everybody. Um, let's start off today. I, I mentioned this before here on the program. It's a topic. Um, I kind of take the, the Neil Bortz approach when it comes to the topic of abortion. I, I don't cover it here on the program. It's just not something I just want to delve into here on the show. I'm going to take a look at it from a, a different level. And this was exactly what I thought was going to happen after uh, the, the, the case after it was laid out. And obviously we, we kind of, we kind of knew what was going to happen based upon the leak, uh, that came out. But, um, I, I knew, I knew, uh, at this point in time, based upon where the position of the Democrats are, uh, with popularity, with the economy polls, you name it, let's just face it. They're in the toilet right now. Okay. They are. They're not doing too well. Let's just leave it at that. And Joe Biden came out. He made a statement on the Supreme Court case, and he said, this is it. This is what's going to be on the ballot. You better vote the right way this fall. And one of the things that we pride ourselves on here on the program is dispelling narratives. We explain to narratives are like a virus. And the narrative right now is going to be, hey, listen, you know, the, you better vote for us. And next, next up, they're going to take away gay marriage. Next up, this is going to happen. That's going to happen. This is the narrative. This is what's going to be sold to the electorate for this fall by the donkeys. Is it going to work? I don't know. I, it, it might. It might, I, I've got plenty of emails, people calling up to show, that's not going to work. That won't work. Uh, it might. I might. They, we did just elect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Okay, so the elephants better get their freaking act together on something. They, they better get their act together on something and actually put forward an agenda. Something, anything. And, and you know, the funny thing is, I have, it's okay to put out moonshots. What do I mean by that? You take a look at the, the type of, even though they didn't get their Green New Deal passed. Well, I, I mean, they've convinced a lot of people, have they not? I'm pushing the country in that direction you, you gotta hand it to the donkeys at least they throw they throw stuff up at the wall i mean their moonshots are, are ridiculous as far as i'm concerned but why not why not come up with your own why, why won't the republicans come up rather than constantly being against something i, I had this the same conversation i got blowback from uh you know, all sorts of so-called conservative Republicans, when I went after Republicans, they, they wanted to get rid of Obamacare. And I, I agree, Obamacare was a disaster from the get-go. Everything that we told you was going to happen in regards to Obamacare, well, it, it, it's happened. It's happened. But anyway, neither here nor there, okay? So the Republicans, we're going to repeal and replace Obamacare. Replace it with what? It's what? You, you really didn't have anything. And, you know, didn't help matters that uh, didn't help matters that that, you know, Donald Trump was unnecessarily nasty to John McCain. Again, you, you don't have to be personal. You really don't have to do. And he did. He went there. But again, neither here nor there. Um, McCain might have volunteered for that guy with the thumbs down. If it wasn't for him, there might have been another elephant that gave the thumbs down on repealing Obamacare. You have to come up with something. You do. Um, one of the things that we've talked about here on the program is, yes, we have to deal with, with immigration. Um, and and it, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It can't be just build a wall and deport everybody. OK, that's not going to happen. OK, I, I, again, I got a better chance taking a starting center field job from Aaron Judge and the Yankees. Yeah, they moved him over to center field. I got a better chance taking his job than that. Any of that stuff actually happening. OK, fine. Building a wall, using the latest great six. That part, you might be able to get some of that done. But you're going to have to compromise to some degree. 
And I, I um, there was actually a piece today in the Wall Street Journal on uh, Maria Salazar. Now, I don't agree with Maria when it came to her position when on Ukraine by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but I did mention this before here on the program. And I, I know, I know, I'm going to get a lot of elephants that are upset with me on this because they, they just seem to think you're going to be able to deport everybody. It's just not going to happen. Um, her Dignity Act, and she doesn't have enough people signing on to it. I, I don't know what Republicans are afraid of. I, I really don't know what they are afraid of. You, you can get hardworking Hispanics over to your side, okay? And this kind of ensures that they're hardworking, all right? First and foremost, it authorizes the funding to fully secure the border, no cost to America's taxpayers. Uh, best border technology available, radar cameras, infrared, secure communications, and autonomous detection technology. Restarts all currently paused border infrastructure contracts and increases funding for physical border infrastructure. Again, to all the people that think the wall is the greatest thing, go, well, there you go. There you go. Hires 3,000 new DHS border security personnel and prioritize the hiring of military veterans and law enforcement agents. Creates a task force to detect and destroy cartel smuggling tunnels along the southern border. All right, have at it. Good luck with that. But again, anybody's actually ever seen these tunnels? Okay. They're nicer than the subway system in New York. Let's just leave it at that. Uh, mandates 100% nationwide e-verify to ensure all American businesses are hiring legal workers. Again, I've been banging this drum for a long, long time. Now, there's been pushback by a lot of businesses because they're saying to themselves, um, if we have to verify all of our workers, we're going to be out of business because we can't find workers. Well, we'll go on here. Increases criminal uh, criminal penalties for illegal border crossings and immediately deports illegal immigrants who commit crimes. Uh, expands U.S. authorities to go after transnational criminals, smugglers, MH13, all that stuff. MS13, excuse me. Establishes four regional processing centers to house asylum claimants. Uh, last in, first out, judicial policy to cut down on multi-year backlog. Hires 1,700 new immigration court personnel. Curbs irregular migration from Central America and address root causes of northern migration by bringing law and order and increased development to Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. Good luck with that. Just threw it in there. Again, just talk. Now, this is the part. Here, here it is. Here's the jagged little pill, as Alanis Moore said. It's an album of hers back from the 1990s. Creates, uh-oh. Uh oh, this is where the elephants get upset. Creates immediate legal status and streamlined path for dreamers. The Dignity Program, it's 10 years. Follow along. Through the 10 year Dignity Program, undocumented immigrants will be provided a chance to work, earn legal status, pay restitution, and get right with the law. They must comply with all federal and state laws, pass a criminal background check, work or serve as a family caregiver, and pay taxes. They must contribute to the American Worker Fund to begin the program. The Dignity Program provides work authorization and protection from removal proceedings as long as conditions are being met. Dignity participants... Okay, these got here illegal or undocumented. They got to pay $10,000 in restitution during the 10 years of the program. They must check in with DHS every two years and must remain in good public standing. Individuals in the Dignity Program will not have access to federal means tested benefits or entitlements. No handouts, no giveaways, no SNAP program. They're going to be net contributors to the tax revenue of the U.S. economy. The redemption program, okay, the Dignity Program is 10 years. The redemption program, you add on five. The redemption program is optional, and individuals must complete the 10-year Dignity Program to start the redemption program. It will offer a chance at redemption and to earn more permanent legal status. The five-year redemption program requires that participants learn English and U.S. civics 
and provides the opportunity for those seeking permanent legal status to contribute to their local community, either through vo local volunteer work, national community service, or increase contributions to the American Worker Fund. It also opens up eligibility for existing pathways to citizenship, but would not be a special pathway. Individuals applying would go to the back of the line. Enforcement through a function and mandatory E-Verify system and certification of a fully secure border will be completed before the redemption program can begin. I, and again, I go into greater detail, but what's the problem with that? What's the problem? Yeah, at some point in time, okay, just to all of you elephants out there, okay, you're going to have to compromise a little bit here. Going to have to compromise a little bit to deal with this problem. This is something that you could, again, you can bring this to the American people like, hmm, you know, I, I, I can see that. We can compromise on that, trying to get something done. Another thing. Um, again, it was a story about this today as well, talking about the need for us to step up when it comes to mental health here in this country. It's a disaster. Disaster. Uh, it's a homelessness problem. I mean, go right on down the list. Another, another major thing that you can tackle, that we as a country can tackle. I've mentioned as well, you know, I really think that, you know, you want the, my moonshot program when it comes to education. Um, the need to establish public, public boarding schools. That's right. Public boarding schools. Again, got a lot of fancy pants boarding schools all over the country, in particular in New England. You know, they're all over the place up there. And again, it's, it's, it's kind of funny. Now that they're actively recruiting, they're actively recruiting kids that are good athletes now and convincing parents for the kids to Stay back another year. You're going to pay discounted tuition. That's another money, money scam or money grubbing thing. But hey, listen, my parents, I got, they've got the money. Who's to say? It's up to them. You want to send your kids there? Fine. And obviously, these are feeder schools to Ivy League institutions and the NESCAC schools and straight on through. And they're, you know, again, highly regarded schools. Neither here nor there. Why can't we do the same damn thing with public schools? And these public boarding schools, again, they, they would be a little bit more intensive, okay? And it would involve finding at-risk kids. Involve finding at-risk kids and saying, hey, you know what? You told the parents, and, and I'm going to be upfront, and, and I know this for a fact, like if I, friends, family that are in education, my father was an educator. Some parents just don't, how shall I put it, give a shit about their kids. They just don't. I, some of the stories that I hear, and, and I, I, I'm like, I, I said, I couldn't do your job because I'd end up beating a shit out of some of these parents that couldn't do it. You go, you, you, you can. Yeah, I don't care if you got to cut a check. Somebody's parents said, listen, we're going to take your kid. We're going to send him to this public boarding school. In essence, you got to raise the kid. You got to give them everything that they're not getting with in the home. And you got to teach them honor and dignity and respect and, you know, instill self-esteem and all of these things that kids are getting in good, solid homes. And, and if you can do that, I think, you know, it's going to cost some money. It's an You want to talk about an investment that will pay off? Just do the math on how much money we spend on incarceration, the court system. You know, we got people in and out. It's a freaking revolving door. What it's hitting, I mentioned last week, talking about all of the robberies taking place in New York. Nobody even does anything about them anymore. This, this is investment, yes, but it could pay off. Again, my moonshot idea right then and there. Again, it's something that I think Republicans need to ta tackle also as well. So as well, yeah, again, on the heels of this abortion decision, you know, why not get out in front of this and say, hey, listen, uh, we have an issue here in this country. I forget what the number is. It's, it's, I think it's around four, if I'm not mistaken, and I, I don't have it in front of me, but I, I, it was either 400,000, 450,000. I think I'm, uh, these are foster kids in, in the United States. And many of these, again, once they, they don't, if kids don't get adopted or taken in as youngsters, um, they kind of spend their entire lives in, in this system. Um, why not give, I, I mean, I would grant every sort of 
every sort of tax benefit, you name it, to families willing to take in. Because let's be honest here, okay? Kids are expensive. Kids are expensive. They are. They're, they're not cheap. They're not. Like I got this weekend. Uh, holy cow. Ca- again, I'll get into that in a bit. My adventures, uh, my road warrior adventures of the weekend. I-, I couldn't believe what I spent this past weekend. Oh, no. well, I'll, I'll get to that in a bit. Anyway, anyway, it's just some ideas, okay? You have to be for something. You cannot, all right, these guys are bad. Look what they did to the economy and look at inflation and look at Afghanistan and bad, bad, bad. Can you come up with something? Something. I, I, Rick Scott is out there and he's got his plan in regards to dealing with the SNAP program and putting work requirements back in. That's something. That's good. Okay. But again, there's a lot of negative that goes along with that. Oh, you're taking away this. How about being for something? Again, some of the stuff's going to cost money and I don't give, divert it from something else. I have, you just had Biden today at the G7 agree to spend a 200 billion dollars on roads the, the the new belt and road initiative i think europe's kicking in as a whole a little over 300 and something billion dollars investments around the globe and all of these third world countries i've blown out three blank and tires already this year alone yeah, I, I'm on the road this weekend, and I'm like, I'm taking. I, I, I like, I like to drive cars. I, I like to drive a car. I we took. I took the SUV. I just went with my one son. I took the SUV because I'm like, <laughs> I have to. You're basically four wheeling here, four wheeling. Yeah, bad here. And then they they took me. Ways took me through Philadelphia. I, I again. You know, I, I've been to, I, you know, years ago, was that in Caracas, Venezuela? Somebody, I mean, this is horrible. This is acceptable. We're falling apart here, but hey, Joe's like, hey, I don't send 200 billion over there. Anyway, 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 uh, moving on here. I talked a little bit about the economy. I mentioned him. Yeah, Road Warrior Summers here, there, and everywhere. And um, I spent, I spent, my wife books the hotels. And I'm, you know, okay, we're, we're in the hotel room. We sleep there. I mean, you get in there, you shower, and you, you crash because you're exhausted. Okay. Um, brand new hotel. Right? I'm, I'll tell you where. I was in um, was Milford, Delaware. Milford, Delaware, right in and around there. They built this, they had open land. They built this massive sports complex. There's some, I don't know, 12 turf fields there, and they can hold these big events. And it's, you know, you're, you're driving, you're probably about 45 minutes to Rehoboth Beach. Um, I guess, you, you know, probably about a half an hour into Dover here and there. But anyway, so, you know, you don't feel like driving all over the place. The, kid, the games are done, whatever it may be. So get a hotel. Okay, it's small. This is roadside place. You know, it was in the parking lot of, uh, you know, kind of like a mall situation. Anyway, it was a micro hotel. Never stayed at a micro hotel. Before, microtel by Wyndham. Brand new, clean, no problem. Uh, my my one night stay was a little under $500. Yeah. A, a little under $500 for a microtel. Now, I didn't even get a chance to look today. I was curious to see what they're charging a night at the, the Plaza in New York or the you know one of the hotels down in, in Miami. In fact, wait a second. I, I was in Miami. It was little under a year ago and I stayed at a oh, I stayed at what was it the addition down there? it wasn't $500 a night and again you're, you're telling me you're telling me that the economy's falling apart and people I I don't I, the, the traffic is insane the roads are filled the hotels are filled I okay I mean I know things are gonna, that people are going to pull back to some degree but I mean you got a, a micro tell that's able to charge almost 500 bucks a night. Wow. Anyway, um, want to get into, uh, I got to see today and I'm always thrilled and I have get heads up that, uh, kind of a bit of a hero of mine. Uh, Ken Langone, uh, was a guest this morning on CNBC and I, I sat and watched the interview. He contributed over the course of 
an hour on the program and various different things. And uh, get admit, it puts kind of a smile on my face. Many of the, the topics and things that we cover in the program and also the opinions that I offer up on the program very much <laughs> very much in line with what he had to say today on the program. And it kind of encourages me. I, I do have to admit that. Um, did talk about inflation. He was, like us here, warned that it was coming, that it wasn't transitory. It's the same thing. The Fed should have acted last year. They haven't. Now we're in this situation. Now, um, we are starting to see commodity rollover at this point in time. I don't know if you take a look at some of these commodity prices. They've come down. And they've come down quite a bit. And part of the conversation on the program today is, well, that means that we are actually in a recession or going to be in a recession. And I said it from the get-go. We had negative economic growth. Negative economic growth in the, the first quarter of this year. We get negative economic growth in the second quarter of this year. Well, then technically we are in a recession. I said the sooner the better. Now they're talking about how long and deep this could be. I, again, the fundamentals of the economy overall are, are pretty damn strong. And I think a lot of uh, this recession that we're in right now, uh, if, again, it, it keeps saying it's Fed induced. Not necessarily, guys. I mean, there's a lot of garbage out there. There's a lot of excess in the markets, a lot of crap companies that we warn people about for a period of time. Um, he also, also mentioned as well, he, you know, he, he several times the praise that he gave for Joe Manchin and what Joe Manchin did and pointing out that there's, you know, not many guys like Joe Manchin around anymore that will, you know, put their, that will accept the, you know, get the arrows and the slings and have to deal with all the crap from their party and standing up to it. And basically verbatim what we said here on the program, he said, imagine, imagine if build back better were passed. Imagine what inflation would look like right now. Um, Talked about as well some of the supply chain issues. So Walmart, Target agrees with what they're doing. Like I said, massive sales. You're going to get liquidation. Liquidation coming soon. Be able to pick up a lot of things at uh, many of these big stores after the uh, July 4th holiday. Um, another thing that he touched on, again, near and dear to my heart, and he said this again and again and again, we need to have term limits here in this country. Need to have term limits here in this country. We've got a, a political class, political class that's just, they, they don't, they don't, again, they think that they're above us all. The rules don't apply to them and they need to go. They really do. I, I've often talked about my, my watchdog on Wall Street, axis of evil, big business, politicians and the media working hand in hand to further their own needs. Um, they, they have to go. Yeah, there's a... Um, <laughs> When I'm, uh, I'm on my stepper, on my stepper sometimes, I, I, I watch, you know, series, movies, whatever it may be. And I, I'm watching, it's just it's kind of a bizarre Amazon series. I'm sorry. And it's, it's, they, it's not for the faint of heart by any stretch of the imagination. It's, it's pretty crude. There's no doubt about it. And it's most certainly not for the kids. It's called The Boys. And it's kind of about superheroes that aren't so super. And, you know, it kind of, dawned upon me that, you know, I'm watching how these people act and, and they act kind of like, you know, in a way, in a manner, even though they have superpowers that are politicians acting. They're above it all. They're above it all. They may, we make excuses for them all the time. They can get away with all sorts of things. And, and again, I, I just kind of found it interesting, but yeah, Langone agrees with that too. And he also, as well, he talked a little bit, it was interesting, got into social media got into social media, he talks about the division here in this country. And he always makes the point. He always makes the point uh, when he comes on, and talks about how America is the greatest, greatest country in the world and our best days are in front of very positive all the time. And, and if, listen, if you ever get a chance, I highly recommend it. You got kids that are graduating, whatnot, buy them, buy the kid, the book, I Love Capitalism by Ken Langone. And it's his story. It's just, it's a wonderful book. But anyway, Anyway, he's, he's talking about what, what social media has done and how it's made these divisions even worse. And I, you know, I've seen this for a long period of time. And again, I, 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 don't, I don't think by any, any stretch of the imagination that Mark Zuckerberg had any idea when he started Facebook. In fact, you know, he, he, you know, he wanted to meet girls, okay? He wanted to meet girls and what it has turned into. And... Again, I'm all for free speech 
but we, we have this this forum here right now where it's just you know negative destroy hurt uh, you know people you, you have to at some point in time you have to get away from that you really do um you know i i would strongly suggest if you're gonna you're gonna post something you know it's on your your personal page okay everything that i from here i'm doing this is you know, the, the, uh, I now posting the my money minutes, my podcast, all goes up on our Facebook fan page. I, it, it's nothing, nothing. Am I going to say it's going to be nasty, negative, whatever it be? I may talk about these things on the show. You have to go and listen to the show. But when you're getting into direct conflict and arguing with people, and it delves into this, it's just not, it's not good. And again, this is this is my work page, personal. No pictures the kids, happy birthday, uh, maybe a vacation picture or two or a sports picture and maybe a proud dad moment from time to time because that's what people really want to see. That's, that's, that's uplifting. You know, I, you talk about all the bad things and there's a ton of bad. And I, I, when it comes to social media, and some could argue that there's more bad than good, especially, you know, the kid that, well, kids nowadays, it's a, their form of communication. They, they don't talk to each other on the phone. They didn't even really text that much. I mean, from time to time, it's all on Snap or whatever it may be. But, you know, it's, it's great to see, you know, gone. Oh, geez, my old friend from high school's son got married this weekend. And look at the beautiful wedding photo. Because there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's what you should try to kind of focus on and point uh, your social media postings to. I, I, again, I, it's, you know, ah, you know, you disagreed with the ruling from the Supreme Court and you'd start throwing out all sorts of vile crap. Why? Why? Do you think it's going to, you think you're going to convert somebody to your side? It's not easy to be Socratic and use logic and reason via social media. Okay. It's not. It's not easy. It's not something that you can do. This is something that needs to be, like I said, you sit down, you talk to people face to face. And again, that's where you can come up with some sort of compromise. Anyway, um, talks about, talk about inflation too. One of the things that Langone was mentioning is, he, you know, kind of feeling that the, the Fed has to go much further when it comes to raising rates to tamp it down. I, I'm not so sure about that because, again, we're starting to see the effects of commodities rolling over and a myriad of other things. However, okay, one of the things that I would ask, I would have asked Ken. They, they didn't do it. I said, I, and again, I'm, I, I've been mentioning this here on the program. How the hell? How the hell are you going to get, you know, the Fed going to raise rates? So let's say, you know, some, some make the argument that if inflation's running at 8%, the Fed should raise rates to 10%. How? We're bankrupt. That's it. We're bankrupt. We're, we're, we're going to have to print money. We're going to have to print more money. We're going to do quantitative easing or whatever the hell to, to pay off the interest on our debt. I mean, anybody remember what happened in, in 2000? Again, we're going over to the point. What happened in 2010 when rates went up in some of these European nations? And, and what, what happened there? Though these are, again, these are countries that they don't print their own money. Okay. They don't have their own money. We have our own. You know how much money we'd have to print just to pay for that? The Fed, I mean, it's caught between a rock and a hard place. They can't raise it that high. They just can't. Not possible. I mentioned this before here on the program. You can compare where Paul Volcker was and our national debt back in, you know, 80, 81, 82, compared to today. Come on now. Come on. Silly. Anyway, um, more stories out there talking about investing in value investors and versus growth investors and what this means. Um, I got an idea, people, reading some of these columns. How about doing both? It's called proper asset allocation. A lot of value stocks, gee whiz, things were running up not too long ago. They, nobody wanted to touch them with a 10-foot pole. Nobody wanted to touch them with a 10-foot pole back during the 1990s. What we were doing, we were buying them because they were on sale. They're at a discount. And again, market downturns create even more value. I, I, you know, some of the FANG stocks are now in the value index now. They've come down to that great of a degree. Anyway, um, talk a little bit about uh, this NATO G7 meeting. Well, NATO, well, it's all going hand in hand here. NATO first. NATO is uh, going to increase its high readiness forces to over 300,000. 
uh, biggest overhaul of the collective defense and deterrence since the Cold War. Mm hmm. Um, again, do you understand that all of this, all of this was so unnecessary? It was, it was, it was, this was, would have never happened, would have never happened if Europe decided to be, you know what, we're not going to put all of our eggs in one basket with, with Russia when it comes to energy or all, almost all of their eggs in one basket. I, I, it wouldn't have been possible. Anyway, okay, so now you got a readiness force of, of 300,000. I'm sure they're probably going to be put them in some of these, uh, Poland and some of these uh, Eastern uh, NATO countries as well. I mentioned this earlier, G7 unveils $600 billion global infrastructure plan to counter China's belt and road. And again, uh, for all we know, this could be just talk because that's what politicians like to do. And when they get together, oh man, they love, they love to talk up a big game and never deliver. But again, with that being said, Joe Biden agreed to deploy $200 billion in grants. Um, Congress, just say no. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. We've got enough problems with our own infrastructure here. Hey, listen, okay? You, you want to help, you want to lend expertise, whatever it may be. Um, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, we, we've got enough we've got to deal with right now. We already, you know, quite frankly, $30 trillion in debt. Um, well, I got a number for you. I made a number for you. I, I mentioned here that uh, <laughs> yeah, Russia's going to be making a lot of money off of all of those assets that we left behind. When Russia's rebranded McDonald's restaurants opened in Moscow, they smashed sales records. Yeah, they did. They beat the records uh, that were put in place when the uh, McDonald's first got on the scene. Yeah, we have never seen such a daily turnover in the whole time McDonald's has ever worked in Russia. And he, these stories you're not hearing, you aren't going to hear in the mainstream, you're not going to talk about all of these things that we're doing that, that aren't working. You're not. In fact, you know, it's, it's quite frankly, it's been a complete media blockout when it comes to Russia news. You don't know what they're saying or what their positions are. Yeah, they'll they'll put something out there. If Vladimir says something that's a little off and he starts talking about Peter the Great or something like that, I get that. You know, they love using that, but we don't get much of a information out of there. And that that bothers me. We we, we talk about free press, right? No, I'm sorry, Peter. This this is we get censorship of this stuff. You know, it's funny today, they're talking about how Russia defaulted on its uh, foreign debt for the first time since 1918. They didn't really default on the debt. It's not like they don't have the money. They just can't deliver it. They can't deliver it because of the sanctions that are put on. So does anybody actually really think that Russia defaulted? No. But that's the headline. First time they're going to default since, uh, since Lenin, Vladimir Lenin told the entire world to pound sand when it came to the debt that the uh, SARS put on the books. No. No, they want to pay. There you go. You won't let me pay. Hey, I want to make this perfectly clear. Okay? Um, the invasion of Ukraine was completely and utterly immoral and wrong. Okay? Immoral and wrong. And again, it's a guy I often don't see eye to eye with. You know, Noam Chomsky is actually writing about this. And he said it's just, you know, basically comparing this invasion immoral as was as our invasion of Iraq and what took place there. Again, it's an argument that could be had without a doubt. Um, whatever they're doing here at this G7, I, I guess we now agree to send another air defense system over to the Ukraine. Uh, Russia's now firing missiles into Kiev. What do you think the outcome is going to be? Huh? Do you, you think that they're going to be able to hold on? You know, I, I would strongly be encouraging Zelensky to cut some sort of deal here. Okay, I, I really would. Now, obviously, the, the Russian military has been smacked around but good. But you do understand the type of capabilities that they have, do you not? 
How did you think this was going to end? I mean, no one expected it to be going on this long, myself included. But again, something. Negotiate something. Come up with something. Please, for the sake of these people over there. Anyway, have a great day, everybody. Watchdog on WallStreet.com. Watchdog on WallStreet.com. We'll see you tomorrow.